How's it going? Sorry about that deep sigh just now that you heard on the microphone. That was my fault. Um, good morning. Uh, I want to underscore something really fast. I know Melissa just hit on it, but last week was amazing. We had like 80 or to 100 people, I think, show up to serve. If you're one of them, thank you so much for being here. So last week we had, um, uh, leading up to Serve Sunday, I kind of get this way. We got a little stressed <clears throat> about numbers being met, you know, backpacks being met. We told, we were told 300 was the number we needed. And uh, we far surpassed that with 350 backpacks. Like the, that is the coolest thing to me because these are going far and wide throughout our community to kids that like need these backpacks. And so like we all, um, if you donated, like Melissa said, if you donated, if you served, if you prayed for us, if you thought about us, thank you so much for doing that. Um, it was a great Sunday. We had a great time. Um, so thank you. We can't wait for the next one. Um, we are continuing on in our mixtape series. My name is Cody Colberson. I'm the worship pastor here. Um, we're wrapping this series up this week. Like Melissa said, Bill's back next week. But it's been such a cool series. Um, we've had so many people from so many different walks of life come and just share what the Lord is teaching them. And it's been really cool um, to, to see that. And so the way that, that Bill kind of set this whole thing up, he kind of just, before he left for sabbatical, he kind of just left it up to us. Like, what, what do you want to talk about? Whatever God is teaching you. And so for me, that was um, sort of more of a word than anything else. And so um, it's been this word, abide, uh, for the last maybe, I don't know, a couple of years. It's been such a big word for me. And so uh, it's one of the words we hear a lot in church, but if you're unfamiliar with it, it means to like bear patiently, to tolerate, to endure without yielding or, or to withstand. Another definition here is to wait for. So what I want to talk about this morning is what our lives look like, should look like, abiding in Christ. Um, like if we're going to go by the dictionary version of this word, abiding, abiding in Christ means to continue or to remain or to endure in him. But what does this like tangibly and like, like realistically mean. Um, before we jump into what that should look like, though, I want to share with you a story of what it should not look like, and it all goes back to the late 90s when I was in middle school. Um, I remember being in middle school. We went to Glorieta, New Mexico, which if you're a student in the room, you just got back a few weeks ago. It was awesome. It was like the music, the music was incredible. The messages were incredible. It was a super imp impactful trip, as they all were for me. It was like 60 degrees in the mornings and the evenings. Um, we went outside and we didn't just like immediately start sweating, which was also awesome. We were riding this like camp high, as you do when you go to camp, right? And so uh, we had this day off when we were, in, when we were uh, during camp. We had a day off. And um, so our leaders took us into the downtown square of Santa Fe, right outside of Glorieta for the day. I'm not sure if it's still like this or not in Santa Fe, but at the time, there was like a pretty big hippie and homeless population there. Um, so me and my friends, which were basically like glorified toddlers, you know, middle schoolers, is, is a basically a glorified toddler. Like I just learned to tie my shoes a few years before this. But we had made it our mission. We were going to like go all, you know, 10 or 12 of us or whatever. We were going to go to the downtown Santa Fe, a bunch of 12-year-olds, a bunch of children, we were going to go and preach the word of God and preach it boldly. We were going to watch as the godlessness of downtown Santa Fe crumbled to its knees and fell into confession. And as you probably imagine, like, it didn't go that way. It didn't go well at all, really. So I had this, like, vivid, this vivid memory. It kind of brought back this. I was thinking about it, and I was like, man, that was really <laughs> insane. So, like, if I was a fly on the wall, you know, it was like a group of 12-year-olds, a group of, like, homeless dudes, hippie kind of guys, and these 12-year-olds just yelling at them the whole time. And then the homeless guys and the hippies were yelling back. And it became this, like, sort of a joke in a weird way. Like, it was weird, you know, to go and, like, you know, yell at each other. We just yelled at each other for about 10 minutes. And so I look back on this, and um, it looked more like a protest than like a sharing the word of Jesus with someone gently and, you know, quietly. And so I look back on this, and um, I think about it, and I, and I realize that the stereotype of the judgmental, loud, closed-minded Christian was probably more solidified in those people than it ever had been before. And our hearts 
were in the right place, but our methodology was not. Um, this is not what abiding in Jesus looks like. We are not browbeaters. We are not legalists. We do not have the power to save souls. We are called to gently walk alongside people, not in aggressive opposition to them. But as kids, like, this is just what we thought we were supposed to do, right? Like, this is what we thought you were supposed to do. And this is where things can kind of get tricky, right, as a follower of Jesus. We have this, like, mindset. If we aren't careful, we have this mindset of if we do this or if we do that, then God will magically make our life more simple and just make sense. Um, And I think, like, when we're real honest with ourselves, there's still a part of us that believes this, that our faith in Jesus is, like, transactional. That he rewards us for doing good and he punishes us for doing bad. But here's the deal with that. Like, we're not lap dogs. And God is not the dog trainer from TV. What's his name? Caesar something. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says that it's by grace that we are saved. Hallelujah for that. By grace we are saved. Not by anything we can do. Not by works. So this morning I wanted to look... Um, at John 15, and hopefully we'll learn a little bit about the character of God and how that displays relationally in our lives. Um, to, so to set the scene in John 15, Jesus and his disciples have just finished the Last Supper. There's this like somberness in the room um, because uh, among Jesus and his disciples because a few hours after this, Jesus is going to be detra- betrayed and then crucified. There's very little interaction between the disciples in this chapter, chapter and the chapter surrounding it. Lots of like red text. So you can imagine Jesus, before being crucified, quietly and gently sort of laying out what the next season will look like without him. The disciples at this point are friends, our family. And so he's basically laying things out, what it'll look like without Jesus. And so I want to go to G, uh, John 15, 1 through 2. It says that I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Skipping down to verse 4, if you're reading with us. um, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So what I want to talk a little bit about is the things that God will remove from our lives and the suffering that can come along with that. So we see here in this verse that that, that Christ is the true vine. We are his branches. On a grapevine, we are supposed to see grapes in the same way that we are supposed to see Christ in the Christian. I don't imagine there being many winemakers in the room. If you are, cool. But we are in Texas, and the summers here are stupid. And so... I imagine the summer's being sort of poisonous to grapes. I don't know enough about it, but I do imagine there's probably a few gardeners. Anyone garden in the room? A few of us? You can raise your hands. Cool. It's not weird. Okay, so a couple. All right. One, two. So I have been a gardener before. A um, couple basil plants, tomatoes, that kind of thing. Uh, they all started dying seconds after I put them in the ground, which makes me not a very good gardener, so I'm not really educated. But what I did learn about this process, in this process, is the importance of like pruning, like keeping a tidy garden. And it's not just to keep it tidy, right? Like when we take stuff out, when we remove unwanted elements like branches, grass, and weeds, it's not just to keep it clean. It's so these plants can grow healthy and thrive in the conditions in which they've been planted. And so we see here in John 15, 1 through 3, that Jesus is the vine and God is the vine dresser. We are the branches, which means that we... When we abide in the vine, Jesus, God will prune certain things from our lives. And when he does, we have to trust that his ways are good and that he is good, which isn't always easy. God is the great gardener that will remove the harmful elements in our lives that are not bearing fruit as long as we are abiding in the vine, Jesus. And there are lots of things in our lives that we think do bear fruit that don't. And when we abide in Jesus, follow Jesus, act like Jesus, talk like Jesus, we find our Father faithfully cutting out the weeds and dead branches so that we might thrive and grow and grow more dependent on him, grow more wise in him. But here's the deal with that. Corrections like this don't feel good. 
As a matter of fact, they like, they never feel good. They hurt. Surgery, if you've been through surgery, hurts. And when God cuts things from our lives, sometimes it produces hurt. Sometimes it produces pain. Sometimes it produces suffering. So as followers of Jesus, like, what are we supposed to do with that pain? Like, what are we supposed to do with suffering? Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we are very much in a, like, you do you generation, right? I've, I've literally said this three days ago. Like, you do you. I don't like that I said that, but I'm confessing it on stage. So we are in this you do you generation where our feelings are now steering the ship, right? So we, we put a lot of, like, trust in our feelings, they dictate our reactions, they influence how we treat people, and that can be really harmful. When we put ourselves and our feelings ultimate, that can be very harmful. We make really, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, we make really bad gods, right? Charles Spurgeon, who is this theologian from a long time ago, he, he puts it this way. Christians have experiences and they have feelings, but if they are wise, they never feed upon these things but upon Christ himself. We also emphasize, you see these hashtags all over the place. I don't know if hashtags are still a thing or not, but you see these all, all the time. Self-care, right? We're in this phase of, like, this generation of self-care. Um, and don't get me wrong, like, I am all for the yoga sessions and the head massages and the little cucumbers on your eyeballs, whatever it takes. But you know what, self, um, you know what self-care can turn into really quickly if we don't watch it? It can turn into self-medication really, really fast. Numbing of and distraction from real pain. We run from these things. We want to numb the distraction. We don't want to feel the sting of suffering, of pain. We don't want to feel the sting of sin. And it makes it harder because our culture encourages this. So as followers of Jesus, what do we do with the weight of suffering, which sometimes feels like it's too much to bear? What do we do with that? What are we supposed to do in seasons of desperation and in seasons of wilderness? Like, I don't know if you've ever been camping. Anyone a camper in the room? Go camping. Yeah. So, like, I don't know if you have been here before. I know you have if you've been camping. But, like, sometimes you go camping and you, like, you sleep Horribly. You forget something, or like I don't go camping at all when it's summertime because that's a silly idea. But when the weather is right or when it's cold, I like to go camping. But sometimes what happens is you forget things, or you forget a sleeping bag or pad or whatever, and you're just cold or you sleep bad. What happens is you wake up at four o'clock in the morning. I don't know if you've been, ever been here. You wake up at four o'clock in the morning and it's like, oh my word, we have two and a half hours until the sun comes up. And you're wide awake because you can't sleep. Just waiting for the sun to rise, itching for the sun to rise. Do you know that like, life can feel like this sometimes too? When we're struggling and we're hurting. Maybe you're struggling with <clears throat> your job. Maybe it's something like feeling just out of place or unwelcome or awkward. Maybe you lost someone. Maybe someone's passed away. Maybe someone... Maybe it's from a broken relationship. Maybe you're the one that just got the bad diagnosis. And you're wondering what to do next. And you're just praying that the sun would rise and put an end to this darkness that's come over you. Sometimes these things make us ask these questions like, God, why? Why are you doing this to me? Why did you take this person from me? Why do I have these feelings about myself? Why have you not taken this from me yet? I'll be honest, I cannot tell you how many times I've had those questions, especially over the last year of my life. I'm 37 years old. I have so many people my age, friends my age, that have not lost both parents yet, still have both parents. Parents that can talk to, confide in, make a quick phone, phone call to, call you for advice, talk to you to confide in. Parents that can be grandparents to their kids, that's the one that hurts me the most. I don't have that anymore. Having lost both parents has been the absolute most surreal thing that I've ever had to deal with. Most surreal thing I've ever had to deal with. And I'd be lying if I got up here and talked about how perfect everything was over the last year. God provided this, God provided that, and it's been awesome. And it's like, no, like, I've had, and my wife can attest to this, I've had nights of, like, 
slobbery, snotty mess of breaking down and wondering why God has taken these people from me and why God has taken these people from my kids. I'm not gonna get up here and pretend like it's been easy because it's not been. It's been really, really difficult. It's wrestling and it's questioning. It's through tears and through pain. It's asking these questions. But I think these questions are legitimate. God welcomes our wrestling and our doubt. He's strong enough. He's big enough to handle our wrestling and our doubt. But we have to, at the end of the day, we've got to trust that God is good and his ways are good. So what's our posture, right? What is our posture through suffering? How are we carrying ourselves through suffering? Well, first of all, some action items. If you're in the middle of suffering this morning, if you're in the middle of something heavy this morning, the three, three C's, confession, counseling, community. Suffering is hard, and that is why we have to, like, tur- turbocharge our prayer life. This is where confession steps in, pleading and praying that God would give us strength through this season. We have got to bring these things to the feet of Jesus. But we also have to bring it to people, right? You've got to talk through it with, like, fellow believers, small groups, people you trust. This is where community happens. But also, like, find yourself a Christian licensed unbiased professional that can talk to you through this stuff, can untangle the, like, spaghetti bowl of our brain that suffering makes it feel like we have sometimes, right? Straightens out the wires, asks us questions, unbiased questions that we can really start to work through this stuff. If that is you this morning and you are looking for counseling, I, it's one of my favorite things that we offer here, but free counseling services at the table. Kelly, Spence, and Lisa Tucker lead that ministry, and they're amazing. If that is you, find them, find me. We'll get you hooked up. It's worth it. Trust me. But I think our posture also <clears throat> has a lot to do with not looking at God as the source of our suffering, but instead turning our eyes to the brokenness of the world in which we live. As followers of, of Jesus, with our eyes on a perfect Savior, this place, earth, will never feel like home because it's not home. Remember that when we experience pain and suffering, <clears throat> excuse me, it is because we were first thrust into a world wrought with brokenness and sin. Sometimes we forget this and find it much easier to feel victimized either by our own sin or someone else's sin. I was listening to this message, a podcast the other day, and the pastor had these great words. He said, uh, the enemy wants us to be defined by our wounds while the creator wants us to be defined by what he says about us. He says a lot about us, but two big ones are that we are redeemed and perfectly loved. We're not called to dwell as a victim of our pain, but instead called to rest in the words of Psalm 30, that our weeping might last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy. It sounds like a contradictory statement in the face of suffering. So how do we do that? How do we have joy in suffering? Maybe you're in it. It's like, what? No, I'm grieving, and I don't know what joy is supposed to look like. I get it. I understand you. But we find joy by looking through the trial that we're at and in to the other side of it. Not at our trials. When we look at our trials, when we look at our suffering, we we can get stuck in our suffering. But we have got to look past our suffering, and past our trial. And in this process is when we find the hope that we have in Jesus. There's suffering for the Christian, yes, but there's also an abundant amount of hope and peace to be found in him. No, it's not always easy. But when we think about an easy life and a peaceful life are two kind of different things, aren't they? An easy life is something like our electricity bill is half what it was last month. Awesome. I had... 19 things on my calendar tonight that I was supposed to be at, and they all got canceled, which if you're like me, that's the best news you can receive. Sometimes it's like, oh, I've been wanting to binge Netflix for four and a half hours, and now I can do that. Or I just want to cruise off the back of a cereal box. I don't know if that's still a thing that happens or if it's even a thing that happens, but in my boss, this is okay to go, so I'm going to go. These are circumstantial things that, like, when they happen, it makes life easier, but when we have peace, It's a completely different thing. 
Peace is not circumstantial. Peace is everlasting in the face of the most violent storms because of our hope in Jesus. Look, life is scary and stressful and depressing and unfair, but when we continue to constantly look to Jesus as our source of hope, and when we allow the vine dresser to remove the things that hinder our spiritual growth and our maturity, our lives begin to flourish and grow and mature, and it is all pleasing. It's a pleasing aroma to the Father. I'm going to move down to John 15, 7 through 8. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And Jesus is saying here that when we revolve our lives around him and center our hearts to him and set our eyes on him, God will give us the desires of our heart. This produces fruit in our lives. And Jesus is saying that God is pleased when our lives bear fruit, but only but our lives bear fruit only when we abide in the vine, Jesus. When we continually look to Jesus and pursue him and have hope in him, we find purpose behind that pain. Purpose behind the tears, purpose behind the sadness, purpose behind the anxiety. And it will happen. These processes, I hate to tell you, they continue and continue and continue. But when we go through the hard stuff as Jesus as our rock, it produces all sorts of spiritual fruit that is pleasing to the Lord. And then we are able to look back and see the work that God has done in us and through us, and then we are able to see the transformation that's taking place in our lives. Transformation by the Holy Spirit. As followers of Jesus, we should constantly be looking back on our lives and be able to see the tangible ways that God has provided for us time and time again. We should be able to look back five, ten, five years, 10 years, and see a different person, and see a changed person. If that isn't what you're seeing, like if you're feeling like, you know the movie Groundhog Day? Like if you're feeling like your life just mimics the movie Groundhog Day, like I think that it's really, really important to ask yourself a, a really honest question, which is what are you abiding in? What are you remaining in? What does your life revolve around? Where's your hope coming from? Is God a good luck charm that we rely on like a rabbit's foot when things get hard? Are we thanking God for finding parking spots and lost keys and then cursing his name when our wife or husband or son or daughter or brother or sister gets sick? Does our spiritual life begin and end on Sunday morning? Side note here, but here's a reminder about what Sunday morning is. Sunday mornings are designed so that you might be edified, encouraged, and equipped for the week. Transformation does not happen on a Sunday morning. The Spirit might stir you, might convict you, but real life change happens in small groups, with close friends, time spent reading your Bible, counseling session, praying, podcasts, abiding, continuing on in these sweet, quiet moments with Jesus. That is where life starts to change. It's a lifetime of pursuit. It's not just an hour every Sunday morning, once a week. We should look back five or ten years and see someone that has learned and is learning from the convictions placed on us by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> someone that isn't dwelling in their sin or dwelling as a victim of their sin or someone else's. And I should say this too, like, if you are struggling with sin and you feel like, man, I'm just like knee deep in it and I can't get away from it, I got to tell you this, God is not going to magically remove it from your life. I wish it was that easy. I wish it was that easy. But transformation requires a bold and a holy response by the believer through prayer and community and accountability to respond to God's calling on our lives. We are to be sanctified, which is like a fancy church word that means holier and more righteous, to be set apart from sin. We're to be sanctified, changed, renewed, and transformed in Jesus' name. 
we should be a people that find comfort in the fact that when the storms do come, we can echo the words of David from Psalm 121. That when we lift our eyes up to the hills and we ask ourselves where our help comes from, we are able to confidently respond that our help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. And finally, we're able, we are to look to Christ on the cross. That Jesus' death would forever be a sobering reminder that we are to die to our old life so that we might come alive to the new. Hallelujah for that. That we have a Savior who loves us so deeply that he would die for us. So that the bondage and enslavement of our will to sin has been broken and we were able to see real, tangible transformation in his name. I want to um, invite the band back up. Um, we're going to sing one more song. Um, maybe you're here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus and you're in the thick of it. And you're in that like, season of desperation, and a season of wilderness. Um, but you see the hope on the other side. But maybe you aren't. Maybe you don't know Jesus. You don't know what this whole thing is about. And it feels like there is no hope. You're at the end of your rope and you're thinking like, well, I guess this is what life is. I guess this, I guess this is all it is. It's not. We have hope in Jesus because the grave is empty. Our hope is not in a tomb that still has a body lying in it. Our hope is in the empty grave of the Son of God who says, you can trust me. You can bank your life on me being here for you. Even in your suffering, I'm there. I've suffered on your behalf, so you now have hope in your suffering that I am with you and that I am for you. If that's you this morning, like, and you just want to talk to someone, or you want to pray with someone, or you want someone to pray over you, you just need someone to hear your voice. And this weight of the world or whatever you're dealing with is too much to handle. Please don't just like feel like you're strong enough to handle yourself. We're not. Our hope is in Jesus. But if that's you and you need someone to talk to, I'm going to invite our staff. I think we've got some staff peppered out throughout the service this morning and then maybe the lobby. I want to invite our staff up to the front. They'll be up here on the front of the stage to pray with you, to sit with you, to hear you. to have that conversation with you. So I'd like to pray for us.